Welcome to the digital podcast that explores how different organizations transform the way they create and capture value with digital technology. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for uh, for joining. Thanks for having me, Thomas. So I thought maybe we could start by you introducing yourself and how you ended up with uh, Mendelian. I, I know you've been involved in other startups in the past, so mm-hmm. it would be it would be great to hear your journey and what led you um, to get involved with Mendelian. Thanks, Panos. Uh, I'll give you. I'll, I'll try and keep this short because it's quite a long journey. But basically, my my background academically was molecular genetics and and biochemistry, etc. Then went into clinical medicine and practiced as a clinical doctor for some time. All of this was back in, in South Africa. And actually, alongside that, while I was studying, I built companies that were all you know digital tech companies. And uh, by the time I finished med school, I think I had about three different companies under my belt. Uh, two of them had, had already failed quite spectacularly. But um, but it kind of I started to enjoy the entrepreneurial side, and I'd paid my way through medical school with these companies. And um, and then ultimately, you know, I, I, I'd always taken this approach that medicine is something that, uh, you know, I think has been, is been currently, is done incorrectly. It's all about fixing problems that occur, whereas I've always been much more on the proactive side of medicine. So I always wanted to get into that, that piece of medicine about changing the way we practice medicine rather than actually practicing medicine. So I, I, I stepped between a few of these companies that I had set up and tried to kick off a few things in South Africa, but really realized that any very innovative med tech had to be done in these big centers around the world where there was ecosystems that would allow that and, and, and kind of stimulate that and foster that. So I moved to the UK about... Um, actually must be about seven years ago now. And um, and really at that stage, I, I came in and I was just investing in small health tech startups. Um, you know, at that stage, I think I was probably on company number eight or nine. And that's actually when I met the, the Mendelian team, uh, the founding team. I met them back in 2016 at a conference here in Cambridge where I live. And, uh, and really for me, the sweet spot of what I like to focus on is medicine or, or at least technology that can assist clinicians to stratify patients. I think we're in this process of moving medicine from very generic clinical practice to stratified clinical practice and ultimately maybe personalized medical practice. And there's no way that we can do that without technology to assist us in, in getting these patients onto the right path you know, at, at scale. So that's pretty much the journey of how I've landed up to, to where I am today, Panos. Okay, and and you are the CEO of Mendelian now, right? Yeah, correct. So, so as I as I say, I invested in Mendelian back in I think 2016, and at that stage, I was giving these companies I was investing in one or two days of my time to help them clinically and strategically. And I, I really got interested in, in what Mendelian was doing. And at one stage, in fact, I was doing three days for them. But then along the way, I jumped across to a few of the other health tech startups I was involved in. There was another company that I founded that got got, got a big round of investment in 2021. And uh, as part of that investment, I had to step across full time to help them you know, get the, the product into the US, etc. So we did that in 2021. End of the year, I reached back out to Mendelian and said, look, I can give you a bit of support if need be. And uh, that's when the team mentioned to me that they're actually looking for someone to take them from where they were to potentially the next few steps further. And uh, that's when I jumped in as CEO. So that's been, it's been just a, just about a year now that I've been back in at, at Mendelian. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. And can you uh, maybe say a little bit about the, how Mendelian was formed, you know, uh, who, the, the team, you know, how they, uh, came up with the idea and then also taking us through some of the investment milestones. You mentioned you were an investor yourself, but I, I assume the company went through uh, different stages of investment. So that would be great to um, to explore. Perfect. So, so the company was founded, actually, there were four original founders. They met at Singularity University in California. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Okay. But- yeah, yeah. And in fact, the premise, one of the big premises of that uh, that curriculum is how different advances in tech and you bring them together and they amplify each other. So you end up with a a much bigger advance in some other aspect entirely. And uh, two of the big challenges or at least big advances that was happening back in that that time, which was around 2015 or so, was the advances of genetic medicine or genomic uh, testing, et cetera, genomic sequencing. And then on the other side, big data. 
And really the team, these, these four individuals had, had a background in clinical science, they were a neurologist, there was software developers, et cetera. And, um, and they looked across the world to see what they could solve with some of these big advances in tech. And actually one thing that really stood out was this huge problem of rare disease diagnosis. You know, rare disease is, is a strange anomaly when you, you know, individually, each disease is really you know, significantly rare. In fact, in fact, the, th the threshold to be classified as rare is about one in 2,000 people. But many of these diseases are like one in a million. In fact, some of these diseases, there are only a few ever recorded. And the number of rare diseases is huge. You know, today they think there are about 11,000. Of course, that's growing every day, in fact. And when you combine them, the aggregated prevalence is about one in 10 people has a rare disease. So it's a huge problem in medicine that it hasn't been tackled very effectively and most of these diseases are hard to diagnose you know some are quite easy some stand out very early on uh, but most of these diseases are incredibly hard to diagnose and the diagnosis that they call it the diagnostic odyssey can take i mean some people could could be 20 25 years you know and hopefully we're getting to a point when we're unlocking the ability to find these patients much earlier so the team looked at that challenge and they said this is a this is a big data challenge. You know, there, there's a huge amount of different diseases. They all have different clinical patterns. And then on the other side, you've got the clinicians trying to pattern match. You know, that's what clinicians do when patients walk through the door. You look at them and you say, well, this this patient's got a limp. They've got this. What is that kind of you know what what, in, what is that indicating? And as clinicians, we can't pattern match onto a small enough you know group you know group of of diseases or big enough group of diseases to actually make sense in this modern world that we're moving into. So the idea was, could we bring that data together and present it at the right time? So when the patient is there, or when the clinician is thinking about it, or, or at the right stage in the patient's life. So that's how the company was formed, and uh, they moved the, the company back to to London from California, at least where the, where it was conceptualized, really because. The, one of the founders, Rudy, who I think you, you're familiar with, Panos, uh, he had uh, been to university here, had a bit of a network here. So they set the company up in London. And the journey has been has been very much you know, a winding road from that point. Uh, and initially, we had a product which uh, which was called, we called it uh, internally Mendel App. And basically, it was a search engine. And clinicians could use it when they had very difficult to diagnose patients. They would come in and list the signs and symptoms of the patient and the, and the, and the system would look through all of the published literature, all of the big databases that were out there on rare diseases and list the most likely or potentially the causative disease or gene that might give that clinical pattern. And in fact, it got used quite quite a lot around the world. Um, and um, and I think, you know, to the extent, I think we had one stage, we had about 140 different countries uh, using the product at, at different levels. But we realized quite quickly that it was the tip of the iceberg. You know, these were the very fortunate patients where, where the clinicians were taking the time to dig in and find and, and really research these these things, and uh, and at the same time it was quite hard to figure out as a startup how you monetize something like this. You know, do you charge per use or do you charge a license? But either way, because it was just the tip of the iceberg, we couldn't get the economics to make sense. So we sort of looked at them, we said, well, what, what can we do with this tech? And we realized that if we could take that similar pattern matching um, aspect and put that into electronic records, we could actually find you know, the, the rest of these patients that were in clinical practice showing signs of rare diseases, but where potentially where no one was suspecting that they had a rare disease or they were getting pushed to various different tests um, that might not be the correct test for that, that particular disease. So that's when we sort of said, okay, let's, let's see if we can pivot and create the new tech that we really focused on today, which we call Mendel Scan, which is a medical device which integrates into electronic records and pulls thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of patients at scale and applies these rare disease detection algorithms onto the uh, onto those cases and then brings that to the attention of the clinician. So that's the pivot of the product. And I can give you a bit more information on where we are with that. But from an investment point of view, and I think the early investors in Mendelian were mostly angels. And a lot of them had some connection to the founders or they had uh, you know, family members with rare diseases. Of course, the, the, the big advocates of the technology are people with rare diseases and their families because they understand how long that process is. And then I would say a huge amount of our funding to date has actually come from Innovate UK and some government uh, type grants. I think, you know, yeah. we, have, we have a very interesting place in technology, which is... <laughs> We have a very hard to solve problem. We have medicine that is changing and, and, and we're trying to bring all of these things together 
to land up at a state where one day the software and the, and the product can actually make a significant amount of difference and, and actually generate some revenue back to the founders and, and, and the investors, et cetera. So we've been, it's been quite a long journey from, from a funding point of view, and it's been you know, largely getting some Innovate UK grants to, to build the tech. Um, the, the early funders, we have brought in a number of institutional funders for small tickets, but we've been trying to raise funds <clears throat> for the last few months now. It hasn't been the easiest time, but we've generated a bit of revenue, um, and we can talk to you a bit about that, but it's been a challenge on the, on the funding side, but I think very fortunate to have been able to win some grants along the way. Yeah. And uh, just just a, a question on that. Coming from California, right? I mean, that's where most startups are born and, and they grow and they scale. And, and I understand that in the U.S., there's a lot of um, uh, risk appetite for um, these new um, tech companies. And there's a, there's a big v- VC culture there. Uh, there's a lot of people that are interested to invest in the potential of the technology, less so in generating revenue and seeing actual results, at least uh, uh, initially. Whereas in the UK, I would say it's more co- more conservative. There's less money around. The VC culture is not so uh, mature, right? So, so it, it's puzzling. <laughs> I mean, I understand that there was a network um, in London, um, and I mean. Many startups start with family and friends, and and they grow. But, but you know, just walk us through <laughs> this this decision yeah. to move away from, yeah. you know, yeah. the land of opportunity to <laughs> to more conservative London. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking, of course, on the behalf of the founders here. But from what I can pick up, that that the level of the, in fact, the the idea has always been, and I think if you speak to most, uh, you know, startups in the UK that are tech oriented, you would understand that they're probably aiming to eventually generate some funding in the US and eventually launch yeah. aspects of the US. I mean, there's, it's such a huge market, although it's an incredibly fragmented market that, you know, don't, don't get the idea that you launch into, into the US, you launch into states uh, and you need to behave in different states in a very different way. But um, I think that the, the concept has always been get, in, get the company in a place where you have access to the network, because in order to really start winning funding, you need to build proof of concepts. And when you're building something that's quite detailed, you know, where you've got a lot of data science and, and software development and, and trial and error, it's going to take you some time and a bit of a team. Where can you do that at a reasonable cost? I mean, the downside of being in the U.S. is the cost of, of staff is, is incredibly you know, high. The in California, um, in those days particularly, it was really hard to find anyone because they were all, all getting picked up by the big players that were there. So you couldn't get access to really great uh, software developers and, and all of these players. And here in the UK, you could. Um, so, you know, for us, I think it's been a really good idea to be here. I think the big, the second benefit of being here as an early company is access to these government grants. You know, the UK has yeah. very... In fact, it's got many different layers of that. There's the R&D tax claims that have been really useful to date. I know they're changing later this year. Those types of things, plus the grants, uh, there, there are a significant amount of things that allow you to, to really get things going here. I would say this, the, the piece that really hooked us into the UK is our started, you know, we started to deploy into the NHS. So now we've started to play within the NHS, which has absolutely has got blessings and curses. You know, it's a it's a blessing because as you start getting momentum, you can ramp up things. And, you know, if you start ticking all the boxes that you're required and evidencing that you're doing, you can start getting, you know, in, you know larger scale deployment. But it's an incredibly hard thing to start getting access to. Whereas in the US, you can actually pick up things much easier, you know, they're, they're separating the payer and the provider in the healthcare setting like they do in the US in most instances actually allows you to tap into incentives that are much harder to tap into within the NHS because you've got to tick both boxes of payer and provider at the same time. So I think it's it really was, and it still is, in fact, for us to generate the, the product and really ramp it up, evidence it, and then to start deploying into the US. It's still very much part of our roadmap. I mean, I think we would always you know, look after the NHS and ramp things up within the NHS because there's huge potential here. But I think you would see that it's quite a common thing. And it's quite sad because, as you, as you say, once you get to that point of actually having to generate significant funding, it's quite hard to do that in the UK. So there is this, this sort of gap uh, in that piece of the funding yeah. in the UK. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, uh, you mentioned something there that I want us to pick up on maybe later on, um, uh, you know, this difference between public sector versus private sector, you know, where in the U.S. you have uh, 
private payers that can move um, technology innovation much faster, right? I mean, you have these HMOs where once you make a contract with them, they can you know, distribute it across multiple hospitals, whereas in the NHS, you have these commissioning bodies Mm-hmm. And each each hospital or each group of hospitals has has their own commissioning body. So you have to go through the process again and again mm-hmm. and again. It's almost like starting up again. Um, and, and I've heard many stories of, of startups that have had to go through that. Um, and it takes years, right? Sometimes even decades, which is not what you want as a startup. Um, but maybe we can touch on that later on. Um, so talk more about the 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 technology itself, what does Mendelian, Mendelian do exactly? You know, how, how does it work exactly? I mean, you mentioned you tap into electronic patient records mm-hmm. and you identify uh, different patterns, I guess, um, that lead you to identify symptoms and signs of specific diseases. And then you work with specific doctors. I think I, I, I in my mind, that's how I understand it. But, but please yeah. elaborate uh, on how exactly it works. Yeah, that's completely correct. And I think I think the way that it's probably useful to look at how we land up there. You know, the, the mission of Mendelian is to accelerate the diagnosis of rare disease patients and get them onto that the right management pathways. So you you know, what happens as a young company is, you know, in, in these circumstances you're completely reliant on the NHS and other pieces of the puzzle to make this happen. So you look carefully at what's available and how they work and you and you Build your product to fit into the gaps that you can you can get it into and plug into the things that you can plug it into. So you, you, you're correct. We we integrate into electronic records. We don't take the technology into the records. In fact, we pull the data via APIs. So you know. So so I think the advance in the world of standardization and APIs makes what we're doing very possible and actually makes it quite scalable going forward. So that's one piece of the technology. How do we how do we interface across to different electronic record providers, which in, in the UK there are a few, but in the US there are different ones, in Europe there are a few varieties. How do we set the product up that we can integrate to a multitude of different electronic record providers uh, without changing things too much every single time we, we launch? So that's a piece of the tech that we do. I think, you know, of course, then the other framework that you work, work within in the health tech space is regulation. So we have to look very carefully at the regulations and go. And actually, it's a very interesting space when, you, when you're approaching regulations as a health tech company, because the regulations historically for medical devices were built for physical medical devices. So, that, so a lot of that is, is still sits within the, 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 the literature and at least the, the regulation. Of course, it's evolving quite quickly. But when we started, we had to like look at this regulation and go, how do we adapt this for a software as a technology that actually evolves quite rapidly compared to physical devices and, and all these things? And actually, it's a very creative space, which I never expected, actually. You know, you, you look at the, the, the guidelines and the rules, you've got an idea of what you're trying to achieve over here, you've got the regulations, and you try and figure out how do you build something that you can maintain and build that fits within the framework and does what you're trying to do on that side. So the other piece of the tech is this Mendel Scan platform. So the Mendel Scan platform is actually it's a bit of a no-brainer. It's just a system that integrates. It's a system that allows all of the algorithms to be deployed. And on our side, each algorithm is a disease-specific algorithm. So when people say you have an algorithm for rare diseases, you, know, you could look at it that way, but in fact, we have multiple algorithms for rare diseases. And actually, at each disease level, we have to evaluate it, we have to evidence it, because everything is different. You know, how that patient presents, at what time of life, how many undiagnosed they currently are, what's the economics that fit around that, the impact that fits around it, what's the next step, you know, how easy is it to test this patient, and uh, what is the management pathway, and how effective is the management pathway. And all of that, you know, we, we actually analyze at a disease level. So this is what we do. So in fact, at the moment, we have 40 rare disease algorithms and the combined prevalence of these, these diseases is about one in 500 people. So it already starts to make an impact even at a, a GP practice of 10,000 people. You're going to have some of these patients within their practice. And uh, so ideally, we, we can get in, we can extract the data, we can apply these algorithms to it. And the algorithms really just you know, ex- exactly as you said, they pattern matching onto these things and we identifying patients that reach some form of threshold. Now that threshold is interesting because we have the ability to move that threshold a little bit. Do we want to find a hundred patients to find one positive or, do, or is this an area where the, the health economics and the impact means we need to find, we need to only scan 10 patients to find one patient, you know, but of course, 
the broader you go, the more patients you find. So this is always this, the, the playoff that you're doing. So once we've found a patient, we flag them up and we send a report to the clinician. This is done asynchronously. So it's not point of care. So it's not when the clinician is sitting with their patients, it's done outside of that. And we can talk a little bit more about this because it's very useful. But main, the main reason we've done that is because often these diseases we're flagging these patients for is completely new to the clinician. So you can't do that in this sort of five or 10, 15 minutes that the clinician is sitting with the patient because they haven't yeah. got enough time to, to learn about it or think about it. So we do this asynchronously. They, they do this outside of their sort of day-to-day -day work and they then will review that patient and decide what they would like to go and do forward with that patient. So that's the, the current tech. Some of the algorithms are, are actually fairly simple from a clinical point of view with some data science applied, but some of them where we're looking at very hard to diagnose diseases have really advanced uh, machine learning type algorithms. I mean, most of these things where, where there's an advanced piece of machine learning, it takes a long time to develop and it takes a long time to evidence before we can plug it into the into real world deployment. But we've got a few uh, in the pipeline that I think are going to be pretty interesting. So I, I didn't know this, actually. I, I thought, like everyone else, I was naive thinking that it, it's a single algorithm. But, uh, but I, I guess it makes a lot of sense, what you, what you are saying. And, and I guess for every rare disease, you have to work with clinicians to identify the ground truth, right, of, of the disease before you validate uh, the algorithm. And, and, and I guess that's a process that takes time because you have to go through multiple data, work with the clinicians, identify the symptoms over time, and then say, okay, this works for X amount of patients. It's good enough. The threshold is good enough, right? I guess that's, that's how the process uh, works, which makes a lot of sense. Can you say a little bit about, so, so I would assume that each algorithm has to be um, um, accredited or validated as a medical device is that how it works is yes, that how absolutely. you do it absolutely and and, and you're absolutely right in, in what you've assumed now about how the thing works and actually interestingly and i think really useful for, for other people out there and listening and planning about these things is is our system is evolving as we go forward and actually our understanding of the medical device regulation is evolving and improving and we're starting to understand what we can do and where we can push things a little bit further and, um, and, and, you know, how we validate things historically may not be the way we validate things in the future. So as, as you say, we at, at the moment are disease level and disease specific algorithms. That's mainly because of the validation step. Because if you have, you know, in a clinical setting, it might make much more sense to go. And some of the algorithms that we've worked in and testing are, let's look at all the patients with epilepsy and see which of these patients actually may have an underlying undiagnosed disease that may have a very different management that, uh, that uh, we could put these patients on. Um, but it might not be one disease, it might be 20 or 30 diseases. Of course, with genomic testing, that's, you know, that, the ability to find those diseases has suddenly improved significantly. But the ability to validate an algorithm like that is not that easy because you can't just go to an existing data set and go, we want to find patients with any of these 30 diagnoses. You know, so how do you validate that type of thing enough to get it into real world deployment? But as we get more and more data, as we get better with some of these things, and as we have real world deployments, can we start validating some of these things as we move forward? So that's one of the, the things that we do is we always looking ahead, going right with the work we're doing today, how can we take this data and, and create something that allows us to validate even better algorithms to build even better algorithms etc so so i think that journey is a very useful piece of of you know any company that's trying to enter this space um so yes the validation piece for us right now we so we use three sources of data i would imagine and, and the first is as you say all of the research and publication around a particular disease we take that in we, we analyze it we deal with the key opinion leaders for that disease and we build this clinical picture that then we we apply some data science to and how we apply the data science we buy access to commercially available anonymized patient records and there's some huge data sets within the uk i mean the biggest one we use is 18 million patients this is a huge amount of data and um, but it's quite an expensive data set but of course now we're at this level where where we can afford and pay for these things and in fact we have to and you know with rare diseases you know it's like finding a needle in the haystack but you need the haystack so, so buying 18 million patient records is, is the only way we can train our algorithms and do the data analysis. And basically, then we can validate on portions of that data. And what we need to see is that the risk 
is is lower than the ben the potential benefit. And of course, you know, medical device regulation is actually really all about managing the risk and, and making sure the risk is front and central and, and that the benefits outweigh the risk of anything that you produce. So it's a constant juggle between how far can you push this that maybe, yes, you're flagging too many patients, but at the same time, your benefit is, is, is maximized. So, so that's this piece. And we do that at a, at a disease level. Right. And I guess a lot of that data you said it's not just electronic patient uh, record data. Um, it's it's other types of data, published um, studies. Um, and I would assume also um, you're getting into bio data banks and potentially linking to studies that look at specific genomic data, right? Even if you are not handling genomic data yourselves, you, you are interested to, you know, make these linkages between electronic patient record data and genomic data with the published studies. So the triangulation, you know, helps you identify some of the early signs of the development of this rare disease in a particular patient. Absolutely. I mean, from the genomic data, you're right in saying that we're not working actually with the, with the fundamental genomic data, but we're working with the structured data that's extracted from that. So how do we, you know, Let's look at patients with a particular diagnosis that has come from the genomic data. So, you know, Genomics England with their 100,000 genome project, 70,000 of those patients were rare disease patients. And not all of them were diagnosed as a result, but I think, I think at the moment it must be between 30 and 40% of those rare disease patients had a, a genetic diagnosis that was found. Can we look at that? Genomics England data is linked to hist historic electronic records of those patients. So you can look backwards and go, right, if we've got 10 patients with this disease, let's look backwards at how they presented. And this is where some of the magic comes about. You know, we I'll give you an example of a disease, a, a disease called Bichette syndrome, where th these are auto-inflammation disease and they have a number of symptoms that, that appear over time and it kind of sets and, and progresses in adulthood. One of the big symptoms is joint pains and these types of things. But there are a few little things like they get something called anterior uveitis, which is, a, which is something that occurs in the eye. And these patients present to primary care and primary care physicians just you know, they get confused with it. They misdiagnose that as, as conjunctivitis. And we see that in the records. We see these patients diagnosed and we look backwards and we see, all right, here's a, here's a conjunctivitis and there's a number of them. We know that they get anterior uveitis. So we're making the assumption that, yes, in fact, it looks like these are potentially misdiagnoses. So in our algorithm, we not only factor in anterior uveitis, we factor in patients who have the pattern plus a little, you know, if there's an indication of repeated conjunctivitis, that may be a misdiagnosis. So, so these learnings are things that we wouldn't be able to do without the real world data and without access to these historic records that, that, that we use to build these things. So absolutely. So your partners, you mentioned NHS, but let's say, I mean, I'm a, I'm a patient. I, I want to find out about whether I have rare diseases, right? Um, is there a service? I mean, are you thinking, maybe there's no service now, but are you thinking about this in the future of, okay, we can make this available to patients who want to screen for rare diseases? So, of course, along the journey at Mendelian, we've toyed with this many times. How can we, you know, the patients are really the people who know the pain of this diagnostic journey, and this is where we're trying to solve it. Of course, the medical device regulation of anything you're taking directly to a patient is significantly higher. You know, it's a higher risk, in fact, of course. Yeah. Um, so that piece is, is a blocker. But then how do you how do you set something up that can allow patients to come in and do this? Now, of course, the current technology that we have, which it really collects electronic records along the way, that may not work at that level. I mean, today, what we currently have is a population level care planning tool is what the, the medical device regulations call us. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't have a direct to consumer approach where you can come in and enter in all your, your, your clinical signs and symptoms. I think ultimately we will get to these points as we start having enough rare disease algorithms, plus we have enough funding to do these types of things. I mean, the old product where we had the search engine that, that, was used extensively by by the the public, but there was always this question of how do we set this up that that in fact it does still tick the safety boxes of a medical device, but the public can use it. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. So no, we haven't done this yet. I think uh, there's a lot of promise for it. Um, the UK is interesting because of course the NHS 
seems to look after all these patients, but many of them realize that they have to go beyond the NHS to try and identify what, what diseases they have. And I guess there is a huge um, gap between private and public health care, right? And I, I think a lot of these technologies, I mean, in, in your introduction, you mentioned eventually you want to get into personalized medicine. And for a lot of uh, more affluent um, patients that can afford to go to private care, they can also afford to go to these private facilities and, and have personal scans and, 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 and go through the process of identifying their you know, propensity or probability of developing a rare disease in the future, right? Um, but for the public sector is a, is a whole different story, right? So what is, what is the value proposition of Mendelian for the primary care physicians, for primary care, right? For the GPs. So by and large, it's two things that we're trying to get right for them. One is to help them improve the quality of their services to their patients. You know, you know by, by pushing patients along that may have undiagnosed rare diseases, those patients are, are definitely suffering. You know. The second piece is rare disease patients who are undiagnosed are very inefficient at the impact that they have on the rare disease setting, you know, specifically in two ways. One, they go through a number of tests that may not be the correct type of testing for that particular disease. The second thing is that they, their disease progresses without the right type of management. So we've got a lot of diseases that these patients, as they age, will end up having strokes, heart attacks, kidney failure, etc. And these patients are incredibly high burden on the, the health setting, particularly on the primary care, but of course then, then flowing into secondary and tertiary care. So the main premise is, can we set up systems that allow us to find these patients, put them on the right pathway, that makes the, the diagnostic route much more efficient, get them diagnosed earlier and get them onto management much earlier. So I mentioned it earlier in the conversation, we have 40 rare disease algorithms at the moment. Every single one of these, these diseases has a management change, whether that is, um, whether that is there's some clinical trial that's going on for these patients, you know, they can go forward in that way. The second one is, is there a treatment? And, and many of the diseases we have, there is a, a pharmaceutical treatment that makes a significant impact to these patients' lives. And then the third one is as simple as when I mean, there's a good example of a disease called P10 homotoma tumor syndrome, it's a cancer predisposition syndrome. And they have a clinical pattern. So you can pick these patients up early. In fact, some of these signs are, are present at birth, but it's the pattern and the conglomeration of patterns that make you suspect this disease. And if you diagnose these patients, there is no treatment, but you start screening them for cancers much earlier. And of course, as you know, you pick up these cancers earlier, you're going to get a much better outcome. So, so all of these things have an impact. And actually, Panas, I'm not sure if you if you saw the news last week, but we won the NHS's prestigious AI award for, for the product. And uh, we, we're a phase three winner. And what that is, is we have a product that is working and the NHS wants us to really deploy it at scale and evaluate it in an 18 month project. So we're looking at this at the product and, and we're about to kick this off. It's either going to kick off in April or May. And it's 18 months of real world deployment at scale but then an evaluation of how this impacts the patient's lives, the clinical setting, and all of the things that are working here. There's health economics that comes into it, et cetera. So it's quite a big project. And the idea is to evaluate which of these diseases and which algorithms actually perform at a, at a, a level that makes sense for maybe nationwide deployment, and which of them we have to take back and go, right, if we adjusted this threshold a little bit, we should get something that makes sense for the clinical setting. So how do we get this in a place where we, we, we're we having less burden on the health setting and more improvement into the patient health? And somewhere along that balance, you're going to find these things. Well, First of all, Peter, congratulations. I, I saw the news on LinkedIn and, and uh, I mean, it's great news for the company and, and I'm sure that's going to attract more, more investment. Um, so based, based on what you said, um, a couple of things. So you mentioned earlier, let, first, let's focus on the GP and then I want to focus on the pharma, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, journey uh, and potentially partners. So for the GP, you mentioned that it doesn't happen synchronously, right? Mm -hmm. So it's asynchronous. So the GP sees the patient, they make a diagnosis. Um, what happens next? Maybe the diagnosis is, is wrong. Maybe the diagnosis is correct. Do they contact you? Do they see the in the system? Do they get results? Um, and, and then they contact you and they have a consultation. How does it work? 
Yeah, so uh, once again, this shows a little evolution of the product. And um, we used to send these reports directly to each patient's clinician on a monthly basis. And we got a very mixed response. You know, some clinicians are very interested in this and they love these things and they spend time and they look at them and they take them forward. Some of them don't have the time. Maybe they don't have the inclination and they aren't interested. And and actually, this is something that we picked up from the NHS itself. You know, post-COVID, COVID time for us was quite a difficult time because we couldn't deploy our system into the NHS. As you would imagine, we tried to do a little bit of COVID stuff, but it really you know, it, it didn't facilitate large deployment. And and the NHS is dealing with this backlog. That's a major keyword within within any NHS conversation at the moment. And actually, if you think about what we're doing, we, we, we actually are finding patients, the backlog of undiagnosed patients. These patients, if, if clinicians had enough time, if they had spent enough time with them, they may have diagnosed many of these patients. And the NHS is tackling this by it's bringing in what they call, to some degree, operational delivery networks. And and why I like this is because it shows the progression of, of clinical medicine from a very reactive medicine where clinicians are seeing patients that, that have problems. They come in, they book an appointment, they come in, if they've got a problem, they get sent on to much more proactive medicine where, where the, the clinical world and, and the health economics behind it are, are looking and going, how do, we, how do we proactively stop these things from happening? How do we get ahead of this and, and change the direction of these patients before they become problematic? And they realize that clinical clinicians don't have the time in their day-to-day -day management. So they set up these operational delivery networks that come in and with a purpose evaluate a population and make decisions that might change the direction of a number of patients or, or that type of thing. So, so right now we send our reports to little operational delivery network, which involves the clinicians, some nurses, maybe some administrators, and they review these, these patients on a monthly basis, as an example, or every few months in some cases. And we might send through 50 or 100 reports. They will look through those reports. They will access the patient's clinical records because they sit within the same you know, geography and, and clinical setting. And they'll evaluate these patients and decide what they should do with them. And in some cases, these patients are getting recalled. So you might get a, a message on your phone saying, hey, we, you know, we, we're running a program where we're trying to improve the quality. We've identified that you've had these things before, but in fact, there's a disease that we would like to test you for. Would you like to come in for a testing? So there's this proactive nature, and we're getting mixed responses from, from the public on this. Some of them are loving, and some are like, wow, this is, this is quite something. I didn't realize this is happening. And uh, in, in some of the cases, the clinician might just put a note into the patient's file to say, next time this patient comes, because they know many of these patients are coming quite regularly. Let's evaluate and let's discuss this potential disease. And then they start moving them forward. And as I say, these diseases are so different. Some of them, there is a test that, that the, the clinician at a GP practice can do. Some of them, they need to refer on to a specialist for further testing and further, further testing. So it does unlock you know, a different pathway for each of these different diseases. So that's kind of how it's working at the moment. And I think that's the best way to scale it. I can see potentially in the future, the NHS having a dedicated rare disease operational delivery network that is proactively reviewing patient records at scale and identifying those patients who might be showing these early signs of rare diseases and, and communicating with their clinicians to say, this patient has been identified. These are the things you could consider have a discussion with this patient next time you see them, or if it's something serious enough that we think we can make a difference right now, let's actively engage with that patient. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. The consultation with the GP eventually leads to more specialized services and, you know, the continuation of the patient journey is, is, is paramount in this process, right? I mean, you, you need to follow um, up. It's not just a GP appointment and it's not just the GP uh, hunch or uh, intuition that there's something mm. here. Let's let's investigate. Um, it needs to go further than that. And and as you say, developing this center that cr uh, cuts across um, GPs and specialized centers, mm -hmm. evaluating rare diseases is the way to go um, in in relation to coordinating um, uh, these diagnoses across um, across the NHS. Um, I would imagine also. And you mentioned this earlier that some of these early diagnoses may be interesting for clinical trials, right? And 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 pharmaceutical companies, I would imagine, would be very interested in this. Um, so there are synergies there, and and I don't know whether I mean maybe it's still early in the process, but I don't know whether you're thinking about that or whether that's something for the future. <laughs> 
Yeah, so we, we are very actively engaged with pharmaceutical companies. We've got ongoing relations with, with a handful. And um, as you say, they, they have this interest. And the interest is, is twofold. It's yes, if they have treatments for diseases that they are trying to get into clinical trials, there is that piece. In, in rare diseases, a major problem is clinical trial recruitment because you need a number of patients to get statistical significance, etc. So, so there's huge programs that, that actually across many countries, you might need to run clinical trials just to get the numbers. So finding these patients is incredibly valuable for that. We haven't to date done much of that clinical trial work because in, in order, in fact, to get these patients in, you need to find them and then test them and then get them into clinical trials. So a few steps that, that, that kind of that need to happen. But we are chatting to some crowds about that. But on the other side, where there is a treatment that is available, the pharmaceutical companies, of course, understand the value of, of undiagnosed patients very heavily. So, so a lot of the work we've done and, and pharmaceutical companies, you know, what they do to try and move the dial on these undiagnosed patients is generate educational content. So how can we educate the clinical world to identify these patients? So a lot of the work that they've been doing to date is, is upstream of that diagnosis. How do you educate these, these, these clinicians? So we facilitate a little bit of that, like bringing that to the attention, the data of how these patients present, you know, that example of, of misdiagnoses along the journey is a good one, making clinicians think, is this something else rather than, than what I'm you know, seeing on a day to day basis. And so we so to date, a large amount of our rare disease algorithms in the research phases are sponsored and facilitated by the by the pharmaceutical companies. Now, that's an interesting place to be because we're working in a, a world where we're supplying services to the NHS, but we often some of our funding comes from the red from the pharmaceutical companies. So there's regulatory guidelines that we have okay. to work with. So there's technical ways that we do that. We've got a project currently, which uh, the route we use is called joint working. It's the it's the NHS, or at least the UK's regulated and guideline approved way that pharmaceutical companies can work with the, the NHS to try and change and improve patient lives. And, and you know, that, that means you need to be very upfront about what you're doing, what's being paid for, how much money is changing hands, etc. So you try and get rid of any of the obscurity, which is brilliant. So we do that on a, on a regular basis. We do some of these joint working projects. And the idea is to get in and, and pilot something and build evidence that might show a significant improvement in, in a pathway or something. And, and that effect must be passed on to the NHS and to the patients. So how do we do that? So, so yes, we, we, we interact with the pharmaceutical companies a lot. And I foresee that being a big piece of our future from a revenue point of view is, is that piece. Until we get to a point where we can justify enough to the NHS that this type of project across many rare diseases makes economic sense for them. You know, right now, can we get the NHS to pay for this at a large scale across the, the UK? I don't think so. We haven't got enough evidence on, on how big that impact can be. You know, that's one of the hard things about being an innovative company is you often are doing things that people don't understand yet. And the NHS knows they have a problem with rare disease diagnosis, but they don't know how big it is. They don't know the amount of money that could be saved if you change it. There's some models coming around. But about three or four years ago, we paid Imperial College Health Partners to generate a big piece of research on how much undiagnosed rare disease patients cost the NHS. And in fact, the number was huge. You know, there's some people that evaluate that about a quarter of all costs in a health setting might be due to undiagnosed patients. So it's substantial, but building that evidence pack and getting the, the buyers to understand where the value is can take a very long time. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I actually run uh, an exercise in one of my courses where um, I ask um, uh, students to consider the, the cost trade-offs of having patients go through a full body scan um, versus treating them over time. Um, and you know, obviously there you, the, the risk is that you may end up with patients that are very healthy and you just, uh, you know, the, the fees are too high and, and you don't get any return on investment. But as you say, a lot of people suffer from chronic diseases mm -hmm. in addition to the rare diseases that you, you are, you're also focusing on. And that's a significant, um, uh, number in the population that eventually, you know, over time, in the management of their those patients, the costs of you know treating them is higher than doing that initial full body scan. So, so I, I'm not surprised of of that finding from Imperial. 
there, there are two things actually to to mention. One, and and actually we discussed it very briefly previously, you and I. As I've said along this journey, we've focused largely on on rare diseases. But in fact, what our technology does is hard to diagnose diseases. So we're starting to do a number of more common diseases. I think we we have a very deep passion for rare diseases and the patients and the journey. So we'll always have a huge focus on that. But because we know we can make a difference at a, at a big scale for some of these other diseases, we're starting to roll some of these out. And that is something the NHS understands because they can you know, the, the health economics is easy. They push one or two buttons and suddenly you get a, you get a significant change in the outcomes. The other piece is, is something to, to watch and keep an eye on and maybe something to, to update your, your, your course on too. There is a very big movement at the moment about whole, you know, whole genome screening for newborns. And, um, and in fact, it's now been evidenced quite strongly by Stephen Kingsmore in, in California that if you do whole genome sequencing on patients, or babies who end up in the neonatal ICUs, you can get a significant change in management that will offset the original cost of that rapid genome sequencing. I mean, th that type of genome sequencing is, is called rapid and it's significantly more expensive than, than sort of standard whole genome sequencing. But the NHS is, I don't know if you saw the news, they're about to launch a 100,000 patients within the NHS, newborn babies, will get offered whole genome sequencing. These are not neonatal ICU babies. These are just everyday, you know, babies that are born and they may be seemingly healthy. They'll be offering them 100,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 of them will be offered whole genome sequencing. And suddenly you start seeing these health economics come into play. So of that group, how many will they detect diseases in that make a substantial difference? Um, so very interesting uh, stuff coming in that side. Yeah. Of yeah, and 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 you're right. I mean, I, I've been following whole genome sequencing. Um, I think it's a it's an amazing space. And uh, um, I, again, the difference with private sector health insurance and public sector health insurance. I mean, I think in the in the last few years, the cost of doing neonatal uh, uh, whole genome sequencing has dropped significantly. And, I mean, as a parent. I have to uh, think about this. Uh, it's in the best benefit of our child to do uh, this test to identify potential diseases that may emerge in the future that would allow us to better manage that in the event that uh, that uh, happens. And, and, and I think, as you say, I mean, it's not just the, the economics, it's, it's also, you know, about the quality of life and, and that you want to have. Um, and, and if you manage it early on from birth, uh, I, I think it makes a lot more sense. So what are, what are the key challenges that you faced over the years? And I mean, you mentioned regulation and, and you mentioned data, managing data, uh, getting informed consent and, and all that, and, but also managing regulation around medical devices. Those are some of the key challenges, but maybe you can elaborate on some of the things that you faced over the years. Yeah, I think uh, you know I've mentioned a few of these challenges around going into a market that might not be quite ready for for what you're producing is a significant challenge. The the regulation, I would say, anyone that's entering the health tech space, fintech, and a few of these others, you know, you you need to anticipate that a large amount of your time and effort is going to be spent on regulation, understanding it, figuring out, doing all the, the documentation that you need. That's always going to be a challenge. The the data side, I think, is a significant challenge. One, the, the level of data security that you need as a company in this space is significant. And that's at all steps throughout that process. You need to be ensuring data security. And that's two pieces. It's actually getting the processes set up to do that and auditing it and making sure that it's happened. But at the same time, evidencing that because we work with the NHS. The NHS has significantly high standards, which rightfully so, that's a great thing to, to, to have. And we need to show them that we abide by all of these things. So we, we, we do certificates and we, we, you know, we prove and evidence all of these pieces. So that's a challenge. Because of the way the GDPR sets the data control up, these data control, the data control of, of patient data at a primary care sits with the, the primary care practice, which you know, makes a lot of sense. That's where the patients have their, their interaction and their trust. But the challenge there is that because this type of technology is new, there's a lot of uncertainty about how to engage and what needs to happen. Of course, we've done a, a lot of different contracts with with, with these uh, GP practices so we can show them and, and, and educate them as to how, how the NHS likes these things to be done. And the NHS is doing interesting pieces to try and educate across the, the NHS as to how 
you know, significantly wise and sensible data sharing should be done and the frameworks that you need to have. So, so following that pathway, you know, because we've been maybe leaders in some of the stuff and doing large scale projects where no one else has been doing them, you, you come up against this big educational block of no one understanding what the next steps are going to be. So that's been a, a challenge. The NHS itself is challenging because of the, the, the in fact, it's, it's such a disconnected ecosystem. You know, there's so many pieces, like you said, you know, you, you're dealing with individual pieces and you're dealing across vertically and horizontally, you know, like at the top level, you're almost playing a political game to try and get something adopted uh, nationally so there's this and then on the ground you're dealing with the actual clinicians that are seeing these patients so it's a very fragmented space which makes this quite challenging the and and you know in some cases contracts themselves might take 18 months to get signed because they go through various checks and balances internally and that can be incredibly hard for a startup so yeah i think that's one of the big drawbacks of, of working within the NHS is a lot of the bureaucracy and, 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 the, and the box ticking that needs to happen. Um, but, you know, I think, as we said, once you're through that, you know, suddenly you get opened up. So we've just been approached to be become a NHS blueprint. And that's the NHS's approach to taking projects that have been done at a good level and, and making them available for other NHS practices to evaluate and see how they do things. So kind of to really you know, get that, that, that movement across the NHS. I would say, you know, there's always challenges. Having a startup, cash flow is a major, major problem on, on a regular basis. You've got team problems. You know, you, you're trying to keep and, and you know, plan with limited resources what is the best place to staff and resource within the team to, to unlock the next stages. And that's a challenge, definitely. And that's a, something that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a science in many cases. It's really you have to decide on a gamble you know you get as much information as you can as to where you need to resource and you dedicate to that and you know you've got to do that quite far upstream you know you've got to hire you've got to get them embedded in you've got to get them up to speed and then you need to get them productive before you can really take mm -hmm. it on so you're making choices that might only really come to fruition six months time and in a rapidly moving space that's quite a quite a challenge so these are some of the really significant challenges that i'd say right and um in terms of scaling, um, I mean, you mentioned cash flow, and I guess that would be a key challenge in, in scaling, right? I mean, if you don't have the money to hire people and uh, get the, the data that you mentioned, the 8 million data, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to scale your operations, to mm -hmm. improve your algorithms, etc. cetera. Um, but in terms of the actual business model, how... how you know, what are the next steps in, in scaling Mendelian? So I would say, actually, the challenge in scaling is not a resource challenge in the UK for us right now, because everything we do is software and everything we do is building pipelines. So, so for us now, we can roll out new diseases and validate new diseases quite quickly because we've done this 40 times and our pipelines are pretty mm -hmm. good. The, the ability to scale up the tech, you know, we, we rely on all of these cloud-based services that, you know, you just turn on new instances and you expand the instance and it's not particularly expensive to do so. So that, that piece is not hugely challenging. It's the hand-holding and the human-to-human -human interaction that has to happen from an agreement point of view. So, you know, we used to focus on individual GP practices, but right now we know that that doesn't make any sense for us. So we're working on large-scale projects of multiple millions of patients where you go into the new clinical ICS, you know, the integrated care services, which, which are set up to do population health and, and improve population health across many millions of patients. So suddenly we can have less conversations and have less agreements to suddenly start ramping this up. So scaling within the NHS is still, you know, there's still some challenges, but it's not as challenging as, as, as you would imagine. Scaling internationally is a little bit more of a challenge because we need to validate in a new uh, geography on possibly new coding structures and, and integrations. We need to understand and, and get through the, if we go into the US, the FDA regulation, which of course we're working on internally. And that's where some of the, the capital raises that we're looking at is, is to really see how we can take what we're doing now and expand that into, into international settings. You know, the beauty of technology is that we can do this at you know across the globe ultimately if we get if we can get into enough places etc so that's that's really where our challenge is um there's always the ongoing challenge of product market fit can you get this product into a position that's really making a difference enough to allow 
expansion within these geographies and that's a continuous process yeah yeah and are you thinking of um going into private healthcare or are you only targeting public sector yeah great question you know last year we did we scanned about 800,000 patient records or just short of 800,000 patient records to date and um our next step is to take that to five to 10 million patients within the UK. And, and there are projects that we're applying for where we might get access to, in fact, nine million patients in one go. So suddenly the ability to scale this is ramps up. For us, private practice is something that we're going to tackle when we get to the big private practice markets like the US. And, and then we're suddenly talking very different incentives. And, you know, the, the ability of our, our ability to, to choose which algorithms we deploy in a setting makes it quite positive because we go into a setting and we go right in private practice these are the things that make sense at this level and we can start by deploying those things and start then to think a little bit about other projects that we can deploy into so right now we we don't engage at all with private practice in the uk but uh, something we anticipate significantly in the future okay my last question is is about your strategy as a ceo so largely, it's about evidencing what we do and, and figuring out how we can maximize this. I think, you know, as a CEO, you've got to be careful of locking yourself into something without thinking about what the other possibilities are. So we're always scanning to see, is there a pivot of some form that might suddenly unlock 10x of what we're doing? I think we're very set on 10xing things. Can we take 800,000 to 10 million? Can we take our impact from this to 10x? So that's our strategy is surveillancing that i think as a ceo of a company it's really really about empowering your team you know we have a brilliant team and, and getting them in a position that they can deliver what they want you know it's data scientists software engineers clinicians how do we how do we maximize that is a significant piece but i think largely for us it's actually how big can we get within the next next uh, 18 months and we have some significant plans of how we get that out there um, and maximize the the networking that we've done within the nhs i think we've got a we've got a well-known product within certain levels of the nhs how do we take that and and leverage that to really take our impact significantly further that's where we are at the moment how many employees do you have so we do, we're a team of 15 so it's not a huge team but uh but i'd say a very strong team of 15 so i think we we work like a team of 50 <laughs> <laughs> and and then you obviously have your collaborations with the clinicians that help you validate the algorithms, right? Yeah. Are, are, are those um, from the NHS? Are they partners from the NHS? They, I'd say almost 100% of them are NHS clinicians. We engage with them on a, on a private basis to, to build. I mean, in some cases, there's an NHS project that we tap in and, and, and help. We've got a project that we're looking at in Northern Ireland, which is driven by, by the clinical team on that side. So it's a varied mixture, but absolutely, they're very deeply embedded in the NHS and they're generally the key opinion leaders for those particular diseases. And they, they fully understand what we're up to because, you know, they're looking at, they, they know the prevalence of their disease and they know that there's only a fraction of those patients diagnosed at present. So there's literally you know, hundreds of thousands of patients out there that are walking around with undiagnosed diseases. Right. And what about the patients? I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the ones that you have, um, I mean, not, not you directly, but I guess through your GPs, the patients mm. that you have helped and, and, and you gave a couple of examples, but maybe maybe just, you know, in, in terms of closing, you can give some success uh, mm. stories from, you know, patients that have struggled for years to identify what was wrong with them. And then finally, mm. they realize that they are suffering from a rare disease and now they are in the process of managing that. I mean, what, yeah. was, the, what was the experience like? So there, there are huge amounts of stories from the rare disease community of that. Now, in, with our tool and our product, we've got some feedback. I mean, for us, we don't easily get that end result feedback and we don't have that touch point. But I've got some, some feedback recently that, that's well worth sharing. We have a patient that we detected last year, end of last year, that looking back at their records, they've, they're, they're a fairly young patient, but they've had problems that have been going on for 20 or 30 years. And they're living wow. with problems at the moment and this is an interesting case because of the 40 rare disease algorithms 
that patient was flagged by two different algorithms. So there is, of course, overlap in some of the signs and symptoms. So this patient was flagged and we put them forward. And I believe that what we've heard recently is that they, they are currently with the specialist for one of these diseases. And the thinking is that, in fact, it is one of these diseases. So that's going to be a very positive case. And it sounds like in that, that instance, there might not be an immediate magical treatment for these patients, but just the connection of being able to put them into that right place and get managed by a specific team, looking at the problems and, and, and looking forward at the problems that might come. These are the types of things that we're dealing with. I mean, there are many other stories and, and probably we, we, we don't have too much time to go into it. But these are the types of lives that we're hoping to be able to change with, uh, with these things, uh, with this type of tool. Peter, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I am fascinated uh, by Mendelian, and I am sure you will do great. You will do uh, miracles. <laughs> you will help a lot of people, and I think that's, that's what's important. And, and congratulations again for winning the award, and uh, all the best for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Panos, for the time and the interest. Uh, good luck on, on your side.